COVID-19, the virus that requires no introduction, the big bad ever respawning final boss in the game of pathogens, the first disease in our memory to shut down the entire world. As I'm sure everyone is acutely aware, COVID-19 is like a bad reality TV show, a threat that came out of nowhere and gripped the entire world in its debilitating grasp. In March of 2020, when the United States called for the shutdown of schools across the country, I was in eighth grade. My school, nestled in the suburban Central Valley of California, sent all 440 of us home and told us that school would resume fully back to normal on April 15, 2020. I think we all know how well that worked. <laughs> ah, way back to when the pandemic was seen as a vacation from school and work, where milk was our only supply chain issue, and where finding toilet paper was one of our primary concerns. As we all know, April 15, 2020 came and went, and with it, schools across the country remained shuttered, and I, much to my surprise at the time, grew bored of lounging about playing video games. Watching my parents work long hours to save the lives of many afflicted by this deadly virus left me both concerned for their safety and inspired to learn more about this pandemic and how we as a society responded to it. And as I read more and more news stories about overflowing morgues and ventilator shortages, I began to realize that our response to this pandemic was more like the Wild West, <laughs> more like the Wild West than a thoroughly refined modern reaction. And while I think it's safe to say that we would have all preferred the latter, the Wild West did afford me the opportunity to play a small role in mitigating the impacts of this virus because really no one knew what they were doing, even the experts. This desire to create something tangible to help with the increasingly dire situation helped save up the anxiety I felt as the number of deaths and infections continued to mount. As I devoured news stories about the efforts many had implemented in order to try to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic, I read about Prusa, a major 3D printer manufacturer. Essential personal protective equipment, commonly known as PPE, was desperately needed by healthcare workers who were fighting this virus. However, due to increased demand, there was a huge shortage of this, and Prusa recognized this. So they used their large collection of 3D printers to print out over 200,000 face shields, just like this one. And this ignited a global movement, a chain reaction, that led to the printing of millions of face shields globally. I also read about a group of Italian doctors who, in the, in the wake of a tragic disaster in, that occurred in Italy due to COVID-19, used 3D printing to create adapters that let them use scuba masks instead of ventilation masks, allowing them to avert the shortage. Ever since my father first brought home a 3D printer when I was seven years old, I have been fascinated by this technology and how it can seemingly create anything. Well, admittedly, when I was a fifth grader, I mostly used it to create fidget spinners and knock off Lego pieces. But when I grew up a bit more, by eighth grade, I began to realize that this technology had a large application in the fields of engineering and in medicine. So inspired by Prusa and these Italian doctors, and using my knowledge of 3D printing and design, I decided to try to create my own 3D printable ventilator that would be immune to the shortages that we saw with current ventilators, but would also be available at a lower cost in general thereby enabling us to increase ventilator access both in and out of pandemics. To determine where to proceed, I contacted my, my longtime mentor and resource, the internet. Since being first allowed online, I've used the internet as a tool to answer my countless questions, whether that be uh, or countless questions, granting my parents it's a much needed respite, respite from my endless whys and hows. Eventually, this led me to delve onto the maker side of the internet, where I truly discovered this passion of mine. Uh, this passion of mine. Uh, true to its form, the internet proved to be a vital resource in taking this project from the inspiration stage to the, uh, to the implementation phase. My general research process goes something like this. I start by Googling the documentation for like the board I'm working on, or the title of a specific gearing arrangement that I'm looking at, or something of that sort. I then proceed to get distracted by a cat video, or maybe it's a Wikipedia article for the Nike Hercules surface to air missile system, or something of that sort. And then an hour or two later, I realize that I've been distracted for this long and really haven't gotten anything done. From here, I go back to Google and research again and get distracted again. I repeat this normally two to three times. 
unless, until I've somehow stayed on in focus enough to finally find the answer to my question. On, it's normally on some sort of Discord server, or on some YouTube video, or in a 10-year-old forum post. Just somewhere where someone was kind enough to share their knowledge and their experiences with me and others to try to help us get out of these rabbit holes and back onto the main path. One of the major challenges I experienced when I created this ventilator was part shortages, which apparently affected more than Taco Bell sauce packets and those freeze-dried <laughs> strawberries they added to some, the top of some Starbucks drinks. But luckily, unlike strawberries and sauce packets, much of this could be avoided by 3D printing these parts instead. Unfortunately, however, this didn't apply to all parts, especially the motor controller, which was an essential part for this ventilator to function. This, this single shortage of the, this motor controller, which occurred because this had to be made at a circuit board fabrication facility, which had in, increasingly long wait times due to the chip shortage and several other issues, risked me having to put my project on wait for months on end. And although this posed a serious challenge, it also helped epitomize the pandemic well. Because in this state, we were all innovating at home, trying to find ways uh, to get around obstacles like this one that I experienced, even as our institution struggled. And with more research, I found this motor controller by Odrive Robotics, which is an amazing company that created this motor controller and then decided to release its, its design online for free. They made it open source, being that it's widely available at a low cost. And this is also emblematic of the great promise of the internet, where knowledge is democratized, prioritizing human progress over profits, and where, and where a, a teenager can talk to a real engineer to try to solve problems, whether both big or small. And at each step of this journey, I talk to someone, and they talk to someone else, and so on and so forth. And this sort of chain reaction doesn't just end with me. When I presented my ventilator at science fairs or at conventions, it lit a spark in the minds of some who are interested in improving access to healthcare devices and improved healthcare outcomes in rural underserved areas. And I hope that it will spread on from them, and maybe even some of you. And the internet has really allowed us to transfer knowledge between people in a way that scientists working on the Spanish flu over a century ago just couldn't have imagined. It allows knowledge to traverse borders and political boundaries, leading to overall human growth as a whole. Although the tragic consequences of the pandemic illustrated the many infrastructure problems in the United States, it also, allowed, it also, uh, it also was a catalyst for countless innovations each the result of their own chain reaction and the still strong bonds of humans coming together to unite against a terrible final uh, loss, uh, showing us that if we all come together, really nothing is unbeatable. Thank you.